Right, so today we are going to start a scenario model for a, a Nevada earthquake, I think it is. So the first thing you, um, you want to do is go to my research web page and find the, uh, the model assembler um, and the MACME uh, GUI. So that's the tool that um, will help you set up a, uh, a uh, uh, that's the tool that will help you to set up a, uh, a model run. Uh, let's see, oh, I went past it. OK, here we go. So um, it's uh, open source software, and you just uh, download the um, uh, you download the uh, uh, the software. Uh, I'm going to uh, just put it on my desktop, and I'm going to make a new folder called. Um, okay, what's the earthquake that we're going to uh, we're going to model? Olinghaus. So I'll call that folder uh, Olinghaus. Okay. So we'll put the, uh, the zip distribution in there. And then the other thing you want to do uh, while you're on the, the, the uh, web page here is go to these um, uh, data input files and select the, uh, the ones you're going to need. Um, so uh, And of course, first you want to read the acknowledgment and disclaimer because uh, that um, talks about all of the people who have uh, helped, all the groups that have helped. Um, you know, both set up this ability to uh, uh, to model and, and also generating the data, um, and they're uh, from uh, right across the Pacific. Uh, there's also lots of disclaimers here that you should pay attention to. Okay. Um, Let's see. So what are we going to need? Uh, we're going to need VS30 values. These are VS30 values from around California and Nevada, uh, from a lot from class measurements, some from uh, USGS projects. Uh, so we're going to need that one. Download the linked file as. Um, notice that on the public uh, website, there's a Reno sediment thickness uh, map. Uh, but it's uh, encrypted, okay. And um, so, if you want to use it, um, take a look at uh, Mike uh, Widmer's uh, email to me. And uh, basically, uh, um, Washoe County, which generated this data set, Washoe County Water Resources, would like to have this data set used, <coughs> um, but they want to know about all the uses of it. Um, now. Um, However, this uh, Reno Basin, or Reno Area Basin, as it should properly be called, or Truckee Meadows Basin, perhaps, um, this model has not been um, derived from gravity. It's very good. Um, the model is very, very good in, in West Reno, in, like in the area of the Mogul earthquakes. Um, but it's, uh, it's no better than the others I'll show you uh, in East Reno or South Reno. Probably uh, worse in South Reno, this particular one. <coughs> so um, um, we, uh, um, um, where, and I'll I'll use another one uh, today that's uh, that has been published, uh, actually in geophysics. So um, it's a good alternative model, especially if you're focused on West Reno. It's well worth writing to uh, Washoe County, Mike Widmer there. And uh, he's a he's a UNR uh, hydro PhD graduate, so uh, he he very much uh, likes to collaborate with uh, with folks here. Um, there's a Saltus and Jockins uh, map from a 1995 publication um, that is um, <coughs> um, basically gives basin depths at uh, in, in my the rendering of it I have here. Uh, every two kilometers on a grid throughout the entire basin and range. So um, in, in my rendering, that's only up to the north end of Nevada at uh, latitude 42 north. 
but their original model, for which I have the uh, the original ARC info files, uh, does go all the way um, up into Idaho. Um, it goes uh, into eastern California, just not at our latitude here. It stops at the California border, um, and uh, it. Um, 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 and it covers uh, large portions of Southern California, Arizona, uh, almost all of Utah, etc. Um, very useful background model for uh, 3D basin structure. Um, then uh, uh, these are Las Vegas. This is uh, Langenheim's uh, Las Vegas basin thickness. So we're not going to use that today. Ah, here's um, the uh, Abbott and Louis 2000. Um, Year 2000 uh, um, Reno uh, Reno area basin thickness map, and um, so that's the one we'll use today for uh, for Reno. Um, these are some other renderings of um, geotechnical velocities measured in in Reno, um, and uh, uh, we're going to use all the real measurements, no uh, no models. Today, so we already got that. Let's see, San Gabriel River, that's in Southern California. Wellington is in New Zealand. Um, for air, if we wanted to go substantially today into Northern California, we would have to use this Western Great Basin one kilometer grid um, of geology and infer basin depths from that. Um, how uh, how far west is is the grid going to go? What's the the longitude of the uh, southwest corner of the grid. Uh, okay, so it's uh, <coughs> greater. It's east of uh, negative uh, one hundred and twenty, which is the California border at our latitude. So we don't need. Um, we don't need the, and, and that's where Saltus and Jockins do not cover uh, that part of California. There is a Northern California um, community velocity model now, and um, uh, although it doesn't extend into the Sierras, I don't think. Um, so we'll we'll wait. You know, we don't have to use this right now. Let's see, Wellington and Lower Hutt, Yucca Mountain. Okay, so uh, we've got everything we need. And um, oops. Okay. <clears throat> so we can go. Oh, what happened to that? Um, oh, yeah. So uh, let's go ahead and uh, unpack that uh, that file. Uh, there's the there's my Olinghouse folder, and uh, so uh, the first thing I'll do is um, <coughs> is unzip this uh, uh, MA folder, and um, actually what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull everything uh, uh, pull everything. Oh. Let's see, that's not the way to do it. I'll just pull everything out of there and uh, put it in the uh, in the main folder. There's a bunch of uh, Java source and uh, why did I do that? Um, and then compiled uh, Java code. Okay, so I think I pulled all that out, and uh, then I'll arrange things by uh, date modified. Uh, so we got uh, we're going to have everything, everything for the scenario, including all the data sets, is going to be in um, this one uh, this one folder. That means that I can archive this folder, and I'll know exactly what went into the run. Um, 
Uh, now, the, uh, the code that we use to uh, do the wave propagation is, uh, is separate. Okay? And um, right now, we're going to use uh, an older uh, Lawrence Livermore National Lab code, um, coded by my classmate, um, um, uh, Sean Larson. And then we're going, you know, soon we're going to adopt uh, Livermore's newest code, which is called WP4. That's the fourth order one. <clears throat> and uh, it works in a very similar way, so I'm not expecting uh, many problems. Uh, let's see. So, um, uh, so these folders, you know, they're going to contain, um, you know, maybe a gigabyte of output eventually, uh, maybe a couple gigabytes. Um, they're uh, um, they contain all the data files, and the biggest one here is this uh, uh, Jockins geology. Uh, um, that goes along with the uh, um, that goes along with the uh, um, um, the the basin depth map. Uh, the reason for that is that there are different density um, profiles in um, uh, that are kind of average for uh, basin and range uh, volcanic basins versus basin and range. Um, uh, sedimentary basins, and it's a huge assumption in the Saltus and Jockins map. Um, the U.S. Uh, it's a USGS uh, geophysical map published in 1995. The huge assumption is that any uh, contacts that are noted on the ground between the uh, volcanic basin and the and the sedimentary basin they are vertical, vertically dipping, which of course is ne never true. Uh, especially in the Great Basin, um, but uh, it's uh, still an extremely useful uh, data set. And and you you'd think uh, you know don't don't volcanics look like bedrock? I mean uh, you can wander around uh, east of Reno and you can find lots of volcanics at the surface and they're pretty hard. Uh, turns out as you go deeper into most of these basins and they they assembled this information from. Um, oil exploration well logs, mostly from uh, Railroad Valley, Nevada, which is south central Nevada, where there's been oil production since the 60s, I think. Uh, and then also from um, Elko County, where there was a lot of uh, oil exploration in the, in the 80s that stopped. And now there's oil exploration again. Um, but the, uh, uh, that information said that as you go down into these volcanic rifts, and these volcanic basins, the uh, they actually get lighter than the sedimentary basins uh, are, are at uh, you know below a kilometer depth, they're actually looser and lighter. So the bottom of a uh, of a volcanic basin, volcanic filled basin in, in Nevada at least, can be um, uh, an even more prominent geophysical feature than the bottom of a sedimentary basin. <coughs> um, and we could have a whole uh, class on why that's so. Okay, um, it's a very interesting uh, uh, petrologic and uh, tectonic and volcano volcano uh, tectonic uh, um, uh, uh, volcano tectonic uh, um, uh, discussion that one can have. Now notice that uh, Safari has very kindly appended a .txt to all of the the ASCII files that I've downloaded. Okay, and so uh, I'm going to uh, uh, I'm going to have to uh, change that. I have to find all those .txt files and change their uh, painfully this way. Um, Change their uh, so I didn't have Safari the new version of Safari that I have here. Um, you know I haven't managed to set to uh, avoid that. Let's see. There's another one. Oh, interesting. There's an older. Uh, uh, let's see. I'll I'll put that in the trash. That's the older one. I think it's a newer one that I have downloaded that is included in the in the package. 
right. Yeah, and there's a there's a way around it, but you know, since I upgraded to Yosemite, um, you know, everything's a lot of things have been set back to uh, you know prior uh, uh, prior settings or default settings. Always happens. Um, okay. Um, so now um, we're going to start the uh, we're ready to start the software interface that. Uh, Helps us set up the model. Um, let's see here. Go by date modified again. Uh, I can't remember if there's a dot in file here. Um, no, there isn't. Okay. Yeah, that's a uh, that's uh, um, that's for uh, uh, actually the uh, let's try it. The uh, the zip file is double clickable. Let's see what happens. Uh, no, it's not double clickable. It expands. <laughs> Sorry. I'll remove both of those. Okay, uh, the way to uh, um, the way to start this um, on most systems is to find cme.class. There it is. And double click on it. And of course, uh, I, I have to recompile this uh, you know, under, my, uh, under my Apple nameplate. Um, so if I control click. Um, I think I should be able to open it. Yes, I can click open now. All right. <clears throat> um, so uh, uh, let's uh, change the run name to Oling House. And um, <clears throat> once you start this, uh, you know, as you go through various uh, iterations, it's good to just keep it running. Because sadly, there is not yet any way to. Uh, there's a, there's a way to save all the settings you make, but you can't read those back in later, <coughs> and and just change it. You got to enter everything all over again. So it's kind of painful, but um, this is meant to be a tutorial interface, um, and. Uh, <coughs> uh, and and it. Uh, it's uh, it's not meant to be a uh, <coughs> um, uh, you know a commercial solution at this point. Now you can you can select uh, various run platforms, and I need to update them. Um, but basically, these uh, uh, specify what um, you know the environment that you're going to be running in. Now, the environment we're going to be running in is Cogs right now. Um, we don't have this set up on. Uh, on the, the nice new uh, server yet, um, the compute server that they have in the Seismolab. So we're going to use the old ancient compute server. Um, so uh, uh, so first, I, I think I have to SSH to, uh, to crack, which you can do even from outside the university. <coughs> And then, um, uh, then I can SSH to uh, Cogs, and let's see if I can remember my password. Uh, Cogs also has a guest login with the my usual guest password, <coughs> which I will not say here. Got to contact me. Uh, let's see if I can remember my password. Yes. <clears throat> so uh, we're going to query Cogs directly about uh, what its uh, what its setup is. Um, 
So, uh, um, um, let's see, we can find out the name. Um, um, we have to uh, SSH to guest at uh, cogs.sizemo.unr.edu, which you can only do from, <coughs> from inside the Sizemo network. OK, so I said which bash. And uh, so there's, OK, bin bash, that's correct. And then uh, which Java C, because sometimes you want to compile um, Java. So there's the path for, the, for Java C. Um, and then which Java? Okay. And then which CC? And then for the modeling code itself. Which E3D is that? So I filled out the details of the environment, and and we can run, we can want run whatever we want uh, on um, on this platform. I hit apply, okay, <clears throat> and uh, what we've got um, down below is the um, is a line. It's a command. It's a uh, it's a parameter line, and the title of the parameter line is platform. Let's see. I had to I had to first SSH to uh, to crack. Yeah, and then you just SSH cog. Yeah. Right. You have to SSH uh, guest at cogs. Um, so you're into Cox. I mean, say uh, host name, and you should get uh, you know Cogs dot Sizemo you know, you know at edu. <clears throat> yeah, no wonder there's problems. Okay. Well, that's what Cogs thinks its host name is. Uh, it is connectable. Is the password for Cogs the same as your password for UNR? The it's the same uh, guest password I have throughout Sizemo. that close. Kyle, what Cog's password were you using? I'm doing the guess. What's guess the guess password? Uh, don't, don't say it. <coughs> I'll have to clip it out of the... Uh, uh, I could I could write it. Uh, that's a capital letter. Okay. Uh, you know that one. Yeah. And then you just hit apply. Yep. Um, so, and you'll see the values that you entered uh, 
you know, it's saying uh, we're computing on the Intel architecture, um, and then it gives all these uh, these paths. So each this is very much like the get par. Well, it is the get par interface, um, the Java version of it. Um, so we have uh, you know key equals value, um, and uh, you can have repeated values, and it'll take the the or repeated key value pairs, and it will take the uh, uh, the last one it sees. Um, some of these lines you can repeat, and uh, they'll kind of build on each other. So uh, this is the uh, this is going to be the first line of the uh, configuration file is the platform line. So that's why this is uh, page one of eight. Um, so let's go. Uh, let's go next. Let's define our our grid. Okay. Um, so uh, uh, you can see that it's set to uh, what's a New Zealand um, a New Zealand uh, location. Okay. So what's our what's our southwest corner uh, latitude for the Oling House? Thirty nine. 39.316, I tab over to the next field, and our, our longitude is minus 119. Point, uh, point 0.986. Yeah. Okay. And um, we want a grid that is, um, um, this, is a, this is a grid that sits square on the map. I mean, x is going to point east. So that's 90 degrees east of north. Okay, so that's our x azimuth. You can make a tilted grid. Um, and then, uh, what's our east-west extent? Our x length in kilometers. 58. Okay, and uh, our uh, north-south width. Okay, so um, our um, uh, now we got to decide how how deep to make the three D model, all right, and um, uh, we have to make it as deep as our fault rupture is going to go, and this is a pretty big fault. So the fault rupture is probably going to go to uh, um, all the way to uh, um, you know fifteen or maybe more kilometers depth. Um, so we're probably better off making the depth extent of the model 20 kilometers. Okay. Um, and uh, um, uh, the other consideration is: Do we want to include the moho and some of the upper mantle? You know, do we want to? And and in this area, that's uh, that's going to be at. Um, uh, 35 mohos at about 35 kilometers depth, um, and uh, if we were going to have offsets close to 100 kilometers, then there's a chance of seeing um, reflections and refractions from the moho, uh, and we might want to include that. You know, wide angle reflections. The normal reflections from the moho are pretty insignificant in 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 this kind of earthquake modeling exercise. Um, which really depends mostly on surface waves, but there are um, there has been some seismological analysis of um, distances like 90 kilometers after the Loma Prieta earthquake. Uh, uh, there was some speculation about whether the uh, well, some analysis, not just speculation, about whether the moho uh, the the critical uh, reflection from the moho, uh, which arrived at uh, 90 kilometers distance from the Loma Prieta earthquake, and and 90 kilometers is where there was so much damage in Oakland and in um, uh, in the Marina District of San Francisco, so um, you know if we wanted to make sure that that kind of wave um, was um, um, was included, even though we didn't think it would be significant, then we would make our our depth extent forty kilometers to include the Moho, and um, and then we would know for sure. But of course, 40 kilometers versus 20 kilometers depth extent, that doubles the number of um, that doubles the number of uh, <coughs> um, samples 
in the model, <coughs> and uh, <coughs> um, um, and then is and that's going to uh, um, that's going to double the runtime. So we can keep it at twenty for this one since we don't have those far. You know, the distance across the model is not that great. We're, we are going to have relatively low velocities in the um, um, in the near surface, so uh, we need to use this uh, uh, type four uh, boundary condition. So we have absorbing boundaries around the sides. We have a reflective surface, as the surface of the air should be, but um, uh, where uh, very low velocities uh, intersect the surface or intersect the side boundaries uh, near the surface, uh, there's a special uh, uh, there's a special algorithm applied to make sure that uh, the side boundaries don't blow up. Um, so we need that one. Um, now, if I say apply, right? Now there can only be one grid line, right? We each calculation only has one grid that is calculated over, so there's always only one grid line. Notice that the uh, what we're setting here, um, you know, given our uh, there's our lat zero and our lawn zero that we entered. Um, dh is zero point two. That's the grid spacing. <clears throat> the same in all directions. This is not a <coughs> oct tree or a or a or that kind of a deformed grid um, or subsampled grid. It's a it's an absolutely even grid, cubical. Um, so that's dh. The boundary condition that's b equal four coming out there. Um, let's see, active grid. We're going to use a, uh, uh, a finite fault plane. Oh boy. Okay. I'm going to start out by cutting the grid spacing. Uh, let's try it first at uh, point one. Right. Okay. Now notice what happened there. When the grid got large enough. This uh, panel below turned uh, turned yellow. Okay, let's see what it's saying. Um, it has automatically configured it for parallel co computation uh, for two CPUs uh, because it's going to require uh, uh, one point two gigs of uh, of total RAM. Um, so the uh, you know the forty the fifty eight the forty four the twenty kilometers are divided by the point one. And um, and that's uh, um, and that gives us the number of uh, of grid points. So L is the north the north number northing number of grid points. That's four forty one. M is is the depth number of grid points. That's two hundred one. And N is the easting number of grid points. That's five eighty one. And so uh, you multiply those numbers together, and then you multiply by twenty five for E three D anyway. And that gives you the uh, the number of uh, of bytes that the that the computation will take, or it gives you a pretty good estimate. So here uh, the interface is saying, "All right, you're taking more than a gigabyte for this run, so uh, you know that's going to that's going to require um, uh, two CPUs on most uh, clusters, you know, because they're not uh, they're not uh, uh, you know the cluster nodes are not uh, memory heavy, so I'm going to put in uh, uh, 150 meters for the grid spacing, and it turns green again. Okay, it's saying it's going to take uh, uh, 380 uh, megabytes of uh, of RAM. So that's still a pretty efficient calculation. Um, now, given that we we have a uh, uh, elsewhere in here, there's a minimum velocity rule of uh, uh, 360 meters per second is the minimum velocity anywhere on the grid that's that's going to be passed or created, and um, with uh, uh, with this uh, uh, dh and uh, and needing uh, at least six grid points per uh, per wavelength, then um, here's the uh, the maximum frequency we can go up to. Okay. So with this model, um, without any grid dispersion artifacts, we can go up to about a quarter hertz, uh, which is not very high. And I'm willing to push it to uh, 
because I have experience with this, I'm willing to push it to uh, um, to uh, half a hertz. So this is a you know this is a run we can make on one machine. Um, it's low frequency, uh, but it'll be quick that way. And that's how we always want to start. We always want to start with um, um, we always want to start with a um, um, with uh, uh, with low. We always want to start with um, low frequency. You know, quick running models, and then if those work, then we work our way up in frequency. We work our way up to larger and larger compute clusters as we attempt to get to, to higher and higher frequencies. Most of this work is uh, is done, uh, you know, on very large clusters, say by SCEC, up to frequencies of one hertz. So if we do half a hertz, we're we're in really good shape. You know, these calculations are not as as expensive as they as they ought to be, maybe. Okay. So Olinghaus. Um, let's see. I'm going to attempt to save this. Okay. And we're going to save it into. Um, into the Olinghaus um, folder that we made. Okay, so at least there will be some, uh, you know, there will be more of these lines. So there's the grid line. Now there's still some things I need to define. Um, I want um, that. Oh, that's not what I wanted to do yet either. All right. Okay, so we want absorbing free service plus water. We want um, uh, no uh, active grid. That will get turned off anyway. 0.15. Um, yep. Okay, and we're going to uh, implement attenuation and apply. Go to the next one. Okay. Um, all right, we want to use a uh, finite fault plane, okay, um, and uh, we don't want to use a default Richter wavelet. We want to read a SAC file, and um, so what's the uh, the center point? The SAC file is going to contain a default uh, error function or default uh, uh, source. Uh, rupture velocity time function, um, which uh, model assembler will actually create for us, thanks to the work by um, uh, Bill Saverin, uh, my undergraduate intern, one of my undergraduate interns, um, and it's a uh, it's a Gaussian, uh, which is a pretty good average uh, source time function for each point on the fault. What's the center point of the uh, lat one of the center point of the of the fault? Okay, um, we're going to go for a central frequency of uh, 0.5 hertz. You know, really pushing those. Uh, you know, so we have to inspect the results for um, uh, for um, the uh, uh, for problems with the uh, um, uh, for problems with with the grid dispersion. Okay, now uh, I've entered a moment of one uh, times uh, ten to the twenty-fifth power uh, dyne centimeter, and um, that is a uh, is telling me down here that those settings imply a, uh, a magnitude of uh, MW six point zero. Okay, from the simple uh, moment uh, magnitude uh, equation, um, you know, just an empirical relationship. As all magnitudes are, um, how big an earthquake do we want? Uh, how long is this fault? Uh, 15, kilometers. Fifteen kilometers. So uh, yeah, we could probably go up to uh, at least that. Um, yeah. Um, 
17 kilometers. Yeah, maybe not 7.0. Let's, uh, yeah, so I can just, uh, you know, change the values here till I get what I want. Uh, yeah, I'm at uh, 6.46, so maybe 5.5 E25. Uh, that's pretty close to 6.5. Okay. Um, you know, we can have multiple fault segments with delays between them. That's how I concocted the, uh, the, the rupture of the um, uh, Furnace Creek system. Okay, uh, what is the fault strike east of north? 45? Yeah. Okay. It's really much more. I thought I was thinking the Oling House fault is a pretty much uh, east striking fault. But. Well, it wraps around. Ah. So I have to take the center point as the hypotenuse. Right, right. Yeah. Certainly. Okay, that's, that's the best we can do here until we break it. We could break it up into segments, but that's not what we're doing now. So it's uh, left lateral strike slip? Um, I don't know. I think so. Yeah. So, um, it's the pyramid right. So it's probably 90 degrees dip. That's a pretty good assumption. 180 degrees uh, rake. Uh, so we look along the strike, and, um, and we're sitting on the, uh, on the foot wall. Uh, we're sitting on the, the uh, um, you know, looking down strike, which is looking um, northeast. Um, the block on the right is the one we're sitting on, and so to our left, the opposite block. If it's going, um, let's see, if it's going left lateral, then uh, that's 180 degrees, right? Because we our rake is different from our strike vector, so it's 180 degrees. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, let's see. Okay. Now, um, and the strike length is uh, what did you say? Um, Fifteen kilometers. Yeah. And the dip width will make fif fifteen kilometers as well. So it's going to be a square fault. Um, the top depth will leave at zero. Oh no, we got to bury the top a bit um, because there are basins. If we have the fault rupturing into soft, um, either volcanic or sedimentary basin material, then um, then uh, it's a uh, it's a problem. Uh, we get artificially high velocities because moment is distributed evenly across the fault, and where the fault breaks the basin material, uh, those parts of the fault are going to have much less moment per area, um, just because the material is softer. So we got to keep the fault out of those basins. Let's make the top depth two kilometers to absolutely assure that um, it's entirely in basement material. Um, we want to break this towards um, uh, sparks. So you know, looking northeast down the strike of the fault, um, the the from the hypocenter is going to be on the northeast end. And that's going to be seven. The northeast end is seven and a half kilometers from the um, um, from uh, the center of the fault. So we'll put it not quite at the end, maybe seven point two kilometers down along the strike. Strike, and we'll put it all the way at the bottom. So down dip, uh, we'll put it at uh, well, maybe twelve kilometers, not quite at the bottom. And the rupture velocity is a good average. So we'll apply. There's only one source in here. We can have many, up to 100, I think it allows. Um, so there's one source line. So notice that these have changed. It's not just an apply button. And, um, and so we'll apply the parameters to that. And then I'm going to save it. Um, OK. So that's all we got time for today. And. Uh, so we'll come back to this.